Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bridge Church. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Whether you're joining us here at Monarch School or by live stream, this is going to be an incredible day. The work, the Victory College Band from Tulsa, Oklahoma, are our special guest. They're going to be leading in worship today. So let's put our hands together and let's give the Lord some praise. Lift up a shout of victory because this is going to be an incredible day. Hallelujah. The Bible says the sun sets free is free indeed. Feel free to worship with us or come to the front. Yeah. 
God, we thank you that no matter what's going on in our lives, that you are God and you understand everything within our hearts, Lord Jesus. We thank you that your grace is sufficient for us, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you reign above everything that we could feel inside, Lord Jesus. I thank you that even when words can't even express um, what we're feeling, I thank you that you already know, Lord Jesus. And so in that, God, I'm so grateful that worship isn't about us. We can just come to you with worship, without our perfection. And God, I just want to thank you for today. And we just worship you right here in this moment. So right here in this moment, can we begin to lift up our own song? Say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. Come on, lift up your own song. You're worthy, Jesus. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Say you give life.
right now. God has enthroned himself on the praises of his people. Folks, in this service this morning, you have needed a breakthrough in your life or in your family or in your health, and you've been asking God to do something. Well, let me help you out. He's already done it. He has already led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So there is a time to ask, and there is a time to declare. And I'm here to tell you there's never a time to beg because you are heirs of God and you are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You have been seated with him in the heavenlies. This morning is a day to announce and to declare. If you need healing in your body, if you need a breakthrough in your family, it doesn't matter what it is. I want you to declare with them, these bones, these bones are going to sing. Will you lift it up and sing that one more time? Come on, church. Lift up the victory cry to the Lord this morning.
Sing it to him, church. no man in history ever suffered the way Job did. Had so much and lost it all. Now, it didn't help him a whole lot when his friend showed up. It wasn't bad the seven days they kept their mouths shut, but as soon as they started talking, the whole deal went south. And you go by the next 30 chapters of the book, and it just gets worse and worse. Until he lifts up his voice in praise to acknowledge the faithfulness of God, and that's when it broke. Wow. That's when it broke. Yes, sir. Something happens when you declare the praises of God. Amen. When you declare covenant, yes, the Holy Spirit is not done in this part of this service. Amen. There's somebody who is bound, and Jesus wants you free. So I've got a really great question for you. If Jesus wants you free, why do you want to be bound? This is not a day to stay bound. This is a day to step into freedom. So we're going to sing that every day you have been faithful. I want us to sing that chorus one more time, Israel. And I want you to lift your hands and declare it to the Lord. Would you sing it to him? seated, I want you to turn to about a half a dozen people and say, you know what? Every day, he's been faithful. And shake their hands, hug their necks, kiss their cheeks, and let them know they're welcome in the house of the Lord today.
Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> every day, every day, right? Here it is. Well, welcome to Bridge Church. Those of you that are first time, you guys, wow. And those of you online, uh, I so wish you could all be here right now because you'll get the overflow, but... It's, it's awesome. So we want to uh, be able to connect with you. Um, and if you would like to uh, stay informed on events like this throughout this year, if you would uh, text, text NEW, N-E-W, to 410-936-3415. That's 936-3415. Three four one five. There are also QR codes on the back of chairs, and also out in the foyer, right on the table. And uh, I just want to uh, have us welcome our pastor and teacher and leader, Dr. Gary Kellner. Welcome to the New Bridge Church. And you may be seated. Every time I walk in, these guys give me a hand. And it was kind of overwhelming last night. And so my first instinct when they started applause was to go like this. But I'll tell you what, there's a new sound in the house today. And I believe that the Lord is saying, Behold, I make everything new. It is a new season. It is a new day. There's a new period of freedom and release in this city. And you are here to see the start of it on March the 17th, which is interesting because, you know, this is St. Patrick's Day. This is the day that the Irish around the world celebrate when the apostle, St. Patrick, went to the island, declared the gospel. Allegedly, he drove out the snakes. I can't figure out whether those were literal snakes or the English, but he drove the snakes out. And you know, then God used Ireland to save England and to save Scotland. The Irish really saved Western civilization in the next couple of centuries because of a God moment because of one man who had been a slave and had escaped his slavery, stepped into the light of the gospel, and God set him in that nation sovereignly. So you know what? I really don't care what the devil does. I do not care which party is in power in the White House or in the State House because we know who's in charge in God's house. So you better buckle your seat belts because this ain't your mama's bridge church anymore. We, hey, by the way, this is the Victory College Band from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now, you know, Bridgers, we ought to welcome them the way they welcome me to the platform. How about that? You got a standing O in you? Come on. Let's stand up and welcome them to Annapolis. It's going to be a great week. This is just the start, actually, of a powerhouse week that the Holy Spirit had planned. They weren't even supposed to be here today. They were supposed to be in Atlanta. But the Holy Spirit had a different idea. And so this week, 
on Tuesday, we are going to be at the United States Capitol. We're going to visit with Congressman Kevin Hearn, Senator Jim Langford, both of whom are very strong believers. On Wednesday, we're going to be at our state house, visiting with some of the people that God has put there. They are friends of this house, and we are there to support them and encourage them. Wednesday evening, we are going to have an outreach to the Bywater community, and we're going to believe God for a breakthrough. How many of you can just believe God for a breakthrough in Bywater? I don't know about you, but I just kind of get sick and tired of hearing everybody moan and groan about how bad things are in this country, in this city, and in that Bywater community. How many of you know that the, the folks in Bywater are not hopeless? Some of them just don't have hope yet. We have three or four families of our own church who are planted by God in Bywater for a breakthrough. That's what going to be with these guys on Wednesday. But then on Friday night, Pastor Dale Everett is going to be back with us for a healing service. Tyler will be with him leading worship. And I just have to tell you, I believe that what we're going to see on Friday night will be nothing less than a continuation of this spirit of breakthrough that we've seen today. So if you need healing or you know somebody who needs healing, and how many of you know we're all broken somewhere? And we all have folks in our families who are broken somewhere. So we need to get them here because when there is a healer in the house, you know what happens? Folks get healed. It's real complicated. The, uh, the ushers are going to give you postcards. You know the drill. Everybody gets five of these. Give them to your loved ones. Give them to your unsaved loved ones. Give them to your unloved saved ones. But give these to folks all over town. And then the next week is the greatest week of the year on the Christian calendar. It is Easter week. Good Friday, we're going to have one of the premier worship leaders in this country with us, Dan McCauley. He, God has used this young man. I do not know what he eats or drinks, but if I tell you how old he is, you will not believe it once you see him. He is an amazing, amazing, energetic, anointed worship leader. Dan will be with us for Good Friday. I'm going to deliver a Good Friday message targeted to folks who haven't committed their lives to Jesus. It doesn't matter whether they've been baptized or whether they've been confirmed or whether they're church members somewhere. If they are not vitally connected to Jesus, they need to be here. And you know what? They're right two or three services a year when we get those members of our family here, right? All right, that's one of them. And then Easter Sunday morning where we will wish some of our church members a Merry Christmas, because that will be the next time we see some of them. But, but, uh, Dan will be back with us for Easter morning. I just believe the Holy Spirit has orchestrated something in our house. And if he told us about it, we couldn't even have believed it. And one of the young men who has come with the, um, with the Victory Band shared something with their leader, Craig Jerpy, earlier. And I want to ask uh, Paolo to come up. Paolo is from the country of Brazil, where it has one of the greatest revivals in modern history. Paolo, God spoke something into your heart this morning. You don't know anything about Annapolis. You've never been here before. You don't know anything about our church. You just know that the Lord quickened something to you a little bit earlier today. Would you just take a minute and share that with us real quick? Um, we're so not just happy, but we know we're here in an assignment by the Holy Spirit. Amen. We know we're here because God sent us to this place. And since yesterday, 
when Pastor was sharing about the history of this place. And at Victoria College, and revival is in our hearts. We want to see revival in this nation because we know that America is a great influence to the world. And he was speaking about the revival in the past, one of the birthplaces of revival with the Methodists and Prince Osbury, and these words just grabbed me. And God spoke to me about the ancient wells. Can I? I'll hold, yeah, it, I'll yes. hold it for you. And it says in Genesis 26, 18, that and Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had heard had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, for the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And it goes on, and uh, the enemy tries to claim the, the wells back again. By, by the third time, they get the well back. And then it says, so he called its name Rehoboth, because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us. And I looked at the meaning of the word in Hebrew, and it's open space. And he just shared with me that this is actually the name of a city right close to where we are right now. And speaking briefly about the testimony, the way that the Lord brought me and my family here to Victory College, it was just in a moment like this. A meeting that was not planned, but the Lord had a calendar. Victory missions team went to my city and I was in a season asking God so many questions, nothing um, seemed to make sense, but God encountered us there in Brazil and two months later we were here. And after thinking about this, I was here, the Lord spoke to me. It's just like Jesus when he went to the Decapolis he crossed the ocean just to meet one man that was demon-possessed. And miracles broke through. But after the people saw that, actually they told Jesus to leave. And what God was speaking to my heart was that the things that happen, sometimes people are saying that leave, they don't want it, they are shutting their, their hearts. But they know that. Jesus goes back to the same place, to the Decapolis. And it says that they actually begged him, begged Jesus to heal a deaf man. And Jesus said to the deaf man, Epatha, which means be open. We are here because we are claiming that the gates of heaven will be reopened in this, in this place. From the city, we are saying, open up ancient gates. Lift up our hearts, ancient gates. Stretch out your hand in this place. And say, be lifted up and open up ancient gates. And let the King of Lord come in. Say it again, open up ancient gates. And let the King of Lord come in. This is our heart. This is our belief for this place. We are not just happy. We are expectant to see what God is giving birth for today in this day. We love you. In, the, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Give the Lord some praise. Thank you, Paolo. And uh, when you leave today, Probably after such a great service, five postcards is not enough for the healing service or for Easter. You're going to want to pick up more because there are people who don't know it, but they have a Holy Spirit appointment for the next two weeks. They don't even know it. Their lives are about to change. There are folks you struggle with in your families, maybe in your neighborhood, and they're just a royal pain. But heaven has a date on, on its calendar for them. Amen. So the ushers are getting ready to receive the Lord's tithe and our offering. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. We're going to take an offering later in the service for uh, the Victory College Band. 
So you want to hold that back if you're thinking in terms of that. But uh, the ushers are coming forward now. Father, we are so thankful that you have given us the opportunity to be in this house today. Truly, Lord, this place is Rehoboth. It is an open place. There is an open heaven over this place right now. And with that open heaven, all the blessings of heaven flow. So if we need healing, we receive our healing. If we need a word from God, we receive a word from God. If we need to get back into relationship with you, this is the place to do it. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for today. And Lord, your word says, give it and shall be given to you. Press down, shaken together, and running over. Lord, let the blessing of your word come true in the lives of every one of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Would you like to hear from these guys one more time before the word? Let's come. For those of you who are new this morning, for the last couple of months I have been talking about close encounters. What happens when normal, everyday people encounter Jesus? Uh, if you uh, were born before the Dead Sea was just sick, you might remember a movie that uh, Steven Spielberg did called Close Encounters of a Third Kind. And up until Spielberg, Anytime people talked about aliens, they were either here to enslave us or obliterate us. But Spielberg had a different vision. His vision was they just wanted to connect with us. And then everybody remembers E.T., the extraterrestrial, where he's so cute you can put him in a closet full of stuffed animals and you don't even notice him. Well, of course, that's fiction. But we know that the third person of the Trinity came out of his world and stepped down into ours. And those kind of encounters change your life forever. See, when you see Jesus, everybody say, when you see Jesus, it'll make all the difference. Doesn't matter where you come from. Doesn't matter what your rap sheet looks like. It will make all the difference. And what we've seen these last few weeks is that all kinds of people had encounters with him. Seekers, skeptics, practical people, insiders, outsiders, the victims, the shamed, the hopeless. And what we see is that Jesus engaged every one of them, which makes today's encounter really interesting because the folks in today's story weren't Jewish. Okay, that's a really big problem because the Jews were the God's chosen people. They had the covenant. They had the glory. 
They had the prophets. They had the scriptures. If you were a Gentile, it was go to the end of the line. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. And yet, these folks from the wrong side of the tracks, wrong ethnic group, wrong religion, showed up in Jerusalem for the Passover. Now, they hadn't gone the whole nine yards of converting to Judaism, but they were on the right path. So how does Jesus deal with people like this? Well, look at John chapter number 12, verse 20, where we read, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival, and they said to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. They said, Sir... We would see Jesus. And Philip went to Andrew, and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Now, every week we have been looking at the people, and then we have been looking at the method of Jesus with the people. So this encounter is unusual because it's not with an individual, it's with a group. See, God encounters come in all shapes and sizes. And we have learned that one size does not fit all. Well, it's interesting to me that Jesus engaged them where they were. You know, church is weird. You know, we claim we want to see a lot of people get saved, but what we really want to do is we want to clean the fish and then we want to catch them. If you watch the way a lot of churches operate, here's how it goes. First, you believe, then you behave, and then you belong. Once you can check all the boxes, we will let you join the club. What I find interesting about this one, we don't know anything about these Greeks. They might be good Greeks or bad Greeks. Or they might be, like most of us, somewhere in between. But what's interesting is that Jesus met them where they were. And which is where he meets you too. Now, what most strikes me about them is that they were Greek. And that's because the part of Baltimore that I grew up in was known as Greek Town or Highland Town, which is a part of Baltimore where the Germans were actually the majority party, but the Greeks were better with marketing. But I've been around Greeks my whole life. And I love the fact that in our neighborhood, we had two Christmases because the Greek Christians celebrated a different calendar than we did. So we had two Christmases, two Easter's, and two New Year's. We had a holy day every month of the year. I think I've always loved Greek culture, Greek food, and Greeks generally. And it's probably one of the reasons I love our diners in Maryland. When the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding was released some years ago, I saw it the day it hit our local theater. He's Greek. I laughed all the way through it. And when I was coming out of the theater, a very proper, well-put-together older woman looked at me, and she said, are you the gentleman who laughed so hard hard through the movie, and I said, yes, ma'am, I confess I am. And she chuckled, and she said, you made my night. I have never seen anyone enjoy a movie so much. The Greeks came to Jesus out of a particular cultural context. They were inquirers. They were seekers. They were the inheritors of a great intellectual tradition going back to Socrates and beyond, who in my neighborhood was called Socrates, but that's another story. The Greeks were known for asking questions about everything, about the meaning of life, about the structure of life. Now, maybe they had come a long way, or perhaps their word carried them to Jerusalem. In the words of an old TV ad, inquiring minds want to know. 
And even though we're separated from these people by 2,000 years, their approach to life is really a lot closer to ours than most of the people we meet in the Bible. Because in our culture, before we believe, we have to understand. We ask questions. We have stuff in our head we've got to resolve before we can move to faith. Which leads us to the next characteristics of these folks, and that is that they were curious about Jesus. Now, if they were followers of Socrates and Aristotle, they didn't have any place in their worldview for the supernatural. They didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe in miracles. They did not believe in angels. And yet, when they got to Judea, they heard scores of reports about people being healed of every kind of sickness and disease. They heard about insane people being restored to their right minds. Maybe they had heard Jesus teach. And like the temple police who were sent to arrest Jesus on one occasion, they concluded, never a man so spake. And if that's not enough, there's this spontaneous demonstration on Sunday by the common people when Jesus entered Jerusalem on the first day of the week on a day we call Palm Sunday. And the crowds were wild. They were hailing him as a king, which was also confusing because Jesus wasn't royalty. He wasn't a victorious general. He wasn't a revolutionary. He was just a working guy from Galilee. He was a grubby, blue-collar worker. He had not studied with a great teacher. He had never gone to a prelo university. And yet, he said things no one had ever said before. His words were profound in their simplicity. He spoke to everybody in simple stories that caused the most educated to just scratch their heads. Who was this guy? They were curious. They wanted to meet him. They wanted to talk to him. They wanted to satisfy their curiosity. They wanted their questions answered. There's a lot of folks today like them. I think probably some of us are them, or we have been them. There are a lot of people today who are fascinated by Jesus. It is amazing to me that after 2,000 years, more books have been written about this one man than any figure in history. And more than all the other founders of the world's religions combined. What do we say when folks show up who are curious? Well, as we have throughout this study, we start with the people, because that's always where God starts. And then we look at our Lord's method in dealing with them because he is the great physician. He doesn't need x-rays or MRIs. He doesn't need extensive testing. He knows what's in people's hearts. He knows what they need. So it's interesting when they come to Philip, maybe Philip had done business with some of them. Maybe they knew Philip. And they're thinking, as most of us would, if we need to do business at the governor's mansion or the state house, you're not just going to walk in the door. You're going to see if you have a connection. Now, the neighborhood I grew up in always starts business this way. I know a guy. You need hubcaps? I know a guy. So... They went to Philip because somebody said, you know what, I know a guy named Phil, and he's, he's in with this guy. Now, for whatever reason, Philip decides to go to Andrew, who is the person always bringing people to Jesus. And so, you know, Andrew is the one who brought Peter. Andrew is the one who went to Nathaniel. He was always bringing people to Jesus. So Philip's got to be thinking, okay, this is the right avenue to get the guys an interview. 
But it's interesting to me that Jesus didn't feel obligated to give them an interview. He didn't meet with them at all. You say, okay, this is really weird. You're going to talk about the Lord's method of dealing with people. They need to be touched, and he won't even meet with them. Yep, that's right. Now, we might expect that Jesus would have given him a pat on the back and maybe an attaboy. He didn't. He didn't even meet with them. So what is that about? He wasn't cold or unfeeling. But Jesus wasn't running a dog and pony show for the curious. He was clarifying who he was and what he'd come to do. Sometimes Jesus' followers feel obligated to answer people's questions in the way they are asked. Jesus never did. Okay, that still sounds kind of rude, right? Or at least evasive. But Jesus answered questions and responded to people's needs in the way that would most help them. You see that when a religious leader comes to him at night named Nicodemus? A man who obeys the law, a man who has influence. And he starts out with this charming line. You must be born again. Okay, that's a winner. That is exactly not what Nicodemus wanted to hear. Except everybody needs to be born again. And it doesn't matter how good you are, how smart you are, how well-placed your family is, how, whether you've been a good little boy or a good little girl, every one of us need the breath of God in us that regenerates us from the inside out. Everybody. Any other social program for self-improvement is going to fail because God's plan is not self-improvement or self-realization. It's called self-replacement. Then, of course, you remember the woman at the well. This is the woman that nobody wants to be the head of women's ministry in the church. She is a woman with an attitude. She is a woman with problems. She is a woman with a past. And Jesus, the Jew, asked the woman from the wrong ethnic group to give him water. You see, Jesus' questions are never about what we want. They are always about what we need. So in this case, Jesus reframed the discussion. And he shifted away from the Greeks' desire for a personal appearance to his mission. Verse 23, Jesus replied, the hour. That word can mean the time or the specific moment. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I tell you, and of course, King James says, verily, verily, which is biblical language for listen up. Or if you were from the Bronx, yo. So how many of you know that when Jesus says yo, you better listen up? So everybody go, yo. Jesus said, yo. Unless a kernel of wheat falls on the ground and dies, it dies alone. Remains just a seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. This is really a crowd builder, right? I mean, if you're really trying to attract followers, this is the message you want to give them the first time they meet you. He said, whoever serves me must follow me, and wherever I am, my servant will also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. And then he says, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this reason I came to this hour. Then he said, Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. I'll glorify it again. And the crowd was there, and, the, and some said it thundered. And others said an angel had spoken to him. You know, because Jesus is the most attractive figure in history, it is easy to focus on the wrong thing. You imagine the parents who brought their children to sit on his lap. I've always thought Jesus was the kind of carpenter who would stop in the middle of a project to fix a child's broken toy. 
I imagine that he was the kind of neighbor who always had a listening ear. But I also think because of the miracles, it's often easy to focus on the power. But if we focus on the aspects of his life and work that make us curious, we will never really connect to him. If we want to see Jesus, really see Jesus, we have to focus on his death and his resurrection, the reason he came to this earth. This is one reason why I love Easter so much. Every year during Holy Week, I spend an extended period of time every day in the Gospels. I start on Palm Sunday by reading each of the four Gospel writers' accounts of the triumphal entry. On Monday, I read about what Jesus did. This is extremely deep. You want to write it down because it's really complicated. On Sunday, I read about Palm. On Monday, I read about... It clearly, nobody got enough sleep last night. On Monday, everybody reads about Monday. I do the same on Tuesday and Wednesday, and then I take some time just to meditate on what happened that day. When I get to Thursday and to Good Friday, I spend more time each day because we're coming to a climax. And if I can't go with him to Gethsemane, if I can't go with him to the cross, I can never know his heart. I can know about him. I can believe in him. I can even love him, but I can never really know him. Isn't that what Paul said? He said, I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection, but in the fellowship of his sufferings. When I start Holy Week, which is just seven days from today, I focus on the work of Christ to save us. You realize there are some things that God wants to do in us and for us and through us that we can never get apart from the cross. I thank God for the resurrection. I thank God for the ascension because that is God's stamp of approval on Jesus. That is the Father saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And when he sits down at the right hand of the Father, he is sitting in a position of authority to administrate his kingdom, to pray for his people. I'm thankful for that. But I have to understand his heart that led him to accept rejection and suffering. You say, this isn't really the message that I would preach after that worship service today. But isn't it interesting that all four gospel writers focus on the last week of his earthly life? Isn't it interesting that over half the gospel of Mark is about seven days? Since the earliest days of the church, the Christian year began with Easter. New converts were baptized on Easter. People were ordained for ministry on Easter. Why? Because this symbolizes the heart of who we are and what we're about. Now, I've got to tell you, focusing on his works is easier. It's a lot less demanding. I can celebrate the teachings of Jesus or acknowledge his healing power and make no personal commitment to him. It always amuses me when somebody will say, you know, I'm not really sure that I believe Jesus is Lord, but he was a great teacher. No, if he's not Lord, he's not a great teacher. If he's not Lord, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or a fraud. Let's get our heads straight about who he is. But you will meet all kinds of people. Maybe they work with you. Maybe they're members of your family. And they will tell you, he was a great teacher. You know, the world could use the teachings of Jesus. You know, some of those folks are actually in church. They're not in Bridge Church. 
They're in other churches. Haven't you known people in church who all their life, they never go beyond being curious onlookers? A great service like today, they may raise their hands on the outside, but on the inside, they're kind of like this. They're just a little bit distant. See, to me, the worship we had today invites us to celebrate his greatness and his power. But it also invites us to come into an intimate relationship with him. When we focus on his death and his resurrection, it forces us to do something else. It forces us to come to grips with the world's greatest problem, which is human sin. 10,000 years, nobody's found a cure for it. Education can't fix it. Germany was the most enlightened and educated country in the world in the 1930s. But we know what happened. And we know how ad technologically advanced America and England and France and all the Western countries are today. But we've never been able to fix the problem of human nature. We have never been able to fix this crooked timber of humanity. But the cross makes us face it. It makes us face the fact of human sin and rebellion, of that unbridgeable distance between God and people. It forces you and me to fix the sickness that we have that we can't heal. And the terrible price that Jesus paid to heal us. Which means when I move from the curious onlooker to engaging his work, I end up having to deal with myself. Which is exactly why some people would like to stay curious. I don't know about you, but there are times I'll do anything to avoid dealing with me. I'm happy to deal with you. One of my favorite theologians, the great Pentecostal scholar Mark Twain, said, to do good is noble. To urge others to do good, nobler still and more satisfying. When we focus on Jesus and his real reason for coming to earth, it makes us deal with us. It makes us deal with why things are so hopelessly out of sync. And it makes us deal with the fact that we'd really like to think it's somebody else's fault, but it's not. But the positive is when we focus on it, it opens us to the river of healing that flows out from under his throne. And the word of God tells us, Ezekiel 47, Revelation 21, that it heals everything it touches. I'm thankful for physical healing, but I've got to tell you, it's the emotional stuff and the psychological stuff and the family stuff that is a lot harder, right? We can, we can set a broken bone. We can't set a broken heart. When I hear what he says, it's not what John said. It's what he said. When we hear what he said about what happened and why he came, it opens us to the blessings of Calvary. It bless, opens us to full and total forgiveness. And full and total forgiveness doesn't just mean a pardon. It means that I am free on the inside. I am free from the tyranny of failure. I am free from torture and bad memories. I am free from my fear of messing up yet again. Now, we don't know what happened to these Greeks. We don't know whether they believed or whether they didn't. 
Maybe they move beyond their curiosity. Maybe these are some of the Greeks who form the nucleus of the Gentile church. We won't know until we get to heaven, and when we get there, we're not going to care. What we do know is that our Lord has given us a model for dealing with the curious. You guys are starting an incredible week of ministry on the road, and it's going to look like the bars in Star Wars on some occasions. I mean, it's going to be every kind of creature you can possibly imagine. And you're always asking us, what, what, what should I say? What should I say? What should I do? Well, Jesus said, don't sweat that. Even if they're going to kill you, don't sweat that. I'm going to give you the words that you're going to need. But the simplest word of all is that we need to keep the big thing the big thing. And that's challenging. You know, a lot of times when Jesus' followers talk to their, we won't say they're unsafe family members. We will say they're pre-believing family members. Have you ever listened to young believers talk to their family members about Jesus? They all want to talk about the frosting instead of the cake. Or they want to talk about things that are completely extraneous to Jesus, like politics. Well, that really works well. That's why we need the Holy Spirit to help us. If we ask him, he has promised. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will send you another comforter who will lead you into all truth. You know, every story in the Gospels invites us to find ourselves in the story. Who are you? Are you one of the curious? In the words of that great Pentecostal theologian, Joan Rivers, can we talk? Are you one of those folks who kind of sits on the edge? You come to church, maybe you tithe, you do stuff you're expected to do, but on the inside, you're really not on the inside. Have you stayed on the edge? Maybe you're Philip. Maybe you're the one who's always bringing people to Jesus or Andrew. Where are you today? I'm going to suggest to you that this story especially coming as it did at the beginning of Holy Week, is a challenge to us to be more than curious. It's to go all in. Now let me just suggest something in closing. If you believe Jesus is Lord, you've already gone over the line. Let me just briefly rehearse what you people believe. You believe that God sent his son from heaven who became a Jewish blue-collar worker, was killed on Friday, come out of the grave on Sunday, and that brings salvation to the entire human race. You're already over the line. You just have to decide whether you want to wade in the water Wait in the water, children, wait. You didn't know a white boy could sing like that, did you? <laughs> it's one reason I hadn't checked out of Ancestry.com. Wait in the water, God's going to trouble the water. Anybody want to get in the water today? Anybody want to stop just being curious and sitting on the sidelines? Because Jesus never gives himself to those folks. He never gives himself to those folks. 
the only folks he gives himself to are those who come to that cross and they say, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Stand with me. Would you bow your heads for just a minute? One of the most holy moments in a service like this is when we respond to the word of the Lord. Whether we decide to stay on the fringe, on the periphery, or whether we decide that we're going to go all in. The Spirit of God has come to this place in a really powerful way today during our worship service. Annapolis is a great place. God loves Annapolis. But I am going to clue you in. It doesn't need one more church. It has lots of good churches and lots of really good churches. And we've had churches here since the place was established in 1693. If building churches is the key to making stuff right in Annapolis, we're already fixed. How many of you know that's not true? But there is something that makes a difference. And it's people who've been with Jesus. Peter and John the doctors of the law said, were unlearned men. They hadn't been to the university. They hadn't been trained in theology. And it said, yet they saw that they had been with Jesus. Chapter 5 of Acts says that that sense of presence that they carried was so strong that people brought the sick, the lame, the blind. They didn't bring them to church. They laid them in the streets, hoping that they could catch the shadow. Do you want to know where you can go as a Jesus follower? Do you want to know the space that you can live? There's a place that you live where people don't see you as a Christian or an evangelical. They look at you and they say, you know what? Mama's sick. You know, in Africa, in every one of our crusades, we've seen scores of Muslims healed and saved. The first time I preached in Africa, I watched three Muslim girls run to an altar in an 8 o'clock service to give their hearts to Jesus. In Swahili, there is a word for Christian that might surprise you. That word is healer. I have a friend who is prime minister of an African nation. When somebody gets sick in his family, he doesn't call the doctor. He calls me or another member of our team. I'm telling you, there's a place that you can live. If you want to live there, if you want to live there, now we could just keep having church. We can sing a few Christian songs for 15 or 16 minutes. I can be my usual humorous, charming, and sometimes offensive self. But nothing is going to change. I'm giving a different altar call this morning than I have ever given in this church. question is simple. Are you ready to go all in? This isn't the salvation altar call. I don't think we have hordes of unbelievers in this place this morning. This is the word of the Lord to covenant people. Are you ready to go all in? Well, if you are, I want you to step out of your seat and I want you to come stand in, in the presence of the Lord right now. What? Whether, whether you are a victory student, whether you are a bridge member, whoever you are, if you're ready to go all in, 
not just watch the fireworks. Let us engage him. Let us know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to challenge everyone who is in this place. Do not stand on the sideline. The sideline gets you nowhere. Somebody says, well, I like the middle of the road. The middle of the road is a place for yellow lines and dead skunks. If you're ready to go all in today, I want you to just stretch your hands toward the Lord. And I want you to pray after me. Dear Jesus, I want to go all in. I don't want to just be a curious onlooker. I want to be like John and lay my head on your breast. I want to know you in the power of your resurrection and in the fellowship of your sufferings. Lord, I open my heart to you. I open my mind to your word. I give you my will. I give you my heart. And I say, Jesus. Now I want you just to begin to pray. If you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, I want you to pray in the Holy Ghost. Lord, you're up to more in this place than a good service. Lord, you're up to more in this place today than just making us feel good so we can survive till next week. Lord, you want to raise up, as you did here over 200 years ago, an army of men and women who will not be satisfied with just having church when they can respond to the higher call of taking cities. Lord, we want to see this city taken for Jesus. We want to see the power of God manifested on the streets. Lord, we want to see the release of your healing power. We want to see the release of forgiveness and of reconciliation. Spirit of God, we want in. We want in. I want you to press in right now and pray in the Holy Spirit. God wants to release something in your heart today.
and sing that. a few miles away in a little place called Pasadena. All the locals know it. You guys have never heard of it. And we had a, a missionary who had given his life to Germany. He'd gone to Germany right after the Second War. And the Lord used him to plant a church in Stuttgart, the People's Church, that became one of the greatest churches in the world, a source of life to an entire nation. I didn't have a real emotional experience. I was just sitting over on the side, doing what academically oriented people do, everybody else. And I remember saying to the Lord, Jesus, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, in that moment, 
I absolutely knew I would go to Europe. When I went to Bible school a year or two later, I was asked to lead a prayer group for Russia. And the, and the uh, Warsaw Pact nation. There was no chance that was ever going to open. Years later, the CIA said, we can't imagine it could change in 50 years. And 30 days later, the wall fell. And one of the greatest revivals in the history of the church started in a place where the official religion was atheism. That revival took a couple hundred thousand believers to more than three and a half million. The prime minister of Ukraine was a spirit-filled believer. The mayor of Kiev was a spirit-filled believer. It was amazing what God did. When we started our university, we had students who were members of the parliament. It was more than 30 years between the night God spoke to me and that. There is something powerful and profound happening in this place today. Some of you need to take and write in your Bible or write in a computer, make sure you back it up. Write what God spoke to you today. It may be 20 years, 30 years, 40 years from now, but God will come back and confirm what he did this morning. There will be things happen in your life. For some, it may happen this week. It may, for the victory crowd, you're traveling. It may be some cool stuff happen this week. I don't know. Here's what I know. When you say, give me Jesus, what he does. God says, draw near to me, I draw near to you. In the day that you seek me, you will be found in me, says the Lord. That's it. That's the promise. I want to give you a chance to go back to your seats and be seated for just a moment. Because we want to bless this ministry. We want to bless Victory College. You didn't know it, but Bridge Church has already been in partnership with Victory. Kaylin Bonner, who is our social media manager. Mary Wilkerson, who is student ministries, are both recent grads of this school. So victory already has seed in the ground in Annapolis, Maryland. And uh, you know, you never know where stuff like this is going to go. You just don't. I don't worry about that. I'm in sales, not management. You just roll with it. But here's what I know. Uh, the man who founded Victory Christian Center, now Victory Church, Billy Joe Darty was a great man of God. He was a youth pastor. And he had a vision to start a church that would reach the entire city. And his particular denomination that will remain unnamed, but you know very well, said, we don't really need another church in Tulsa. He said, that's okay. He started it anyway. And at Victory, you could sit on the front row and you could have a millionaire sitting next to you or you could have a homeless guy sitting next to you. It was the guttermost to the uttermost in Victory Christian Center. And lots of ministries, lots of pastors came out of that church. But some years back, the Lord spoke to Pastor Billy Joe and Pastor Sharon and said, I want you to plan a school and I want you to multiply this ministry. Craig Derpy is a faculty member. He's head of their online ministries. Uh, Craig, you should grab that mic and, and come up. Craig is uh, leading this group this week. And we're so happy you're here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to... I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be here with these students. You know, we have, I've been talking with Pastor Gary for a few weeks, and it's just, you know, there's something, like he just keeps saying, there's something here. We don't know yet. There's something. But, like, God is moving. And, and I love what God is doing in our students, and, and I love what God is going to do in our students in this city and in every city that we go into. Um, it's really cool when you start to see the revelation in our students at the school. 
It's really amazing what you, could, what you see their growth from when they start to when they finish, as we can see in Kaylin and Mary and some of our students that we've seen all over the world. But what I love is not just the growth that we see within the school and in them personally, but when we put them in situations like this where we mobilize them and we take them out into the cities and meet with other people and other churches and other cultures, is there's just this profound just explosion within them that really puts to the test that growth, that really puts to the test what God is doing inside each and every one of them. And I, and I get to sit back. I, I'm leading this group, sure. But before we left, we were having a, a, a meeting to training and, and talking to them about, this, about these, this week that we're doing. And we asked them what they're excited about, what they're looking forward to. And I said, for me, even though I'm the leader, I said, what I'm most excited about is getting to sit back and watch God move in each and every one of you and see what he's going to do in each and every one and learn from that. Well, thank you. Thank you, Craig. And thank you, all you guys, for giving up spring break. I don't think I was ever that spiritual, but that's a different story. But I want, to, I want us to bless victory. They have already blessed us. Good things are happening in this place, and I believe it's partly because of the seed that victory is sowing here. So what I'd like to ask you to do is the ushers get ready to receive the offering. Uh, if you give online, and you, you go to give, and it'll drop down several choices. You could go to bridge builders. You could go to offering. We guarantee you it will get in the right place. That $10,000 check you write today, we promise you, we understand that that was a special check. That was subtle, wasn't it? I just want you to give out of your overflowing hearts. I want you to give to invest in these 20 young people who have come to us this weekend. I want to go to heaven, and when I see them get their rewards, I can go, <laughs> I'm with them. <laughs> Father, thank you for Victory College, for the band, for this incredible ministry team that's going to help touch this city this week. Lord, just pour out more of your glory, more of your power, more of your blessing on them on them and through them to heal the nations. And Lord, thank you for the bridge crowd. They love giving. They love the kingdom. And Lord, just bless them as they do what they do really well, which is giving crazy. Bless them. Multiply them in the mighty name of Jesus. If you make a check, which is a real old school way to give money, you make it to Bridge Church, Memo, Victory College, it'll get in the right place. Let's stand together as they lead us in one last worship song today.
one more thing before you go. Good news is for sharing. Friday night's the healing service. Anybody comes by yourself, shame on you. We all know folks that need to be healed. Bring it with you on Friday night. Guys, take us home. Come on, give him a shot.